Good evening, everyone. Welcome to BIM Chat. My name is Danielle Pro Mudise, and our guest today is Zakane Ngobeni, another South African basketball legend. So please do post any questions that you have for him. And if you are watching BIM Chat for the first time, welcome. And make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can catch up on any of the other interviews that we've had with um, players that are worthy of being recognized for what they've done for the basketball community. So let's see if we can try and connect with Zagane. Um, don't think he's joined it. I see Katleho Made in Africa has joined. Kolakha, I know I am. Kukibe, Emma Rentia, Miss Emma, thank you so much for tuning in. Jackie Libea, Sekelo, Zingwa, Ruby Sang, Ricky. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm not seeing Zagani here. IGB11. Not seeing Zagani joining the chat. Let's see if we can get him. Dogs Diesel has joined. Been meaning to join him. Thank you very much for joining us. Liam Reed, Koketsu Dire. Not seeing Takane. Second is still not on. Sultan Al Muhammadi, thank you for joining us, tuning in all the way from Kenya. Um, let me end this chat and just give him a call just to check if things are all right on his side and I'll start another another live chat. Cheers, guys. Let me just note this. Please ask TK about the day he went on a rampage and beat Zimbabwe all the way by himself. Okay. Um, we'll make sure that we ask him that. Let's just try and get a hold of him. Oh, there he is, I think. Lucky number TK, just on time. Just as I was about to start another live chat um thanks thanks miss m i've noted your question let's just try and get zakani to join hi zakani Hello. how are you doing now i'm fine thanks how are you i'm okay my blurry what's going on um you are a bit blurry, actually. I know. I'm trying to work on my phone and my brightness. Hello, everybody tuning in. Um, yeah, there's actually a, a few questions that people have already started posting. We were waiting for you. So there were already oh. some questions that were... <laughs> I was just trying to figure to out... I was just about to end it and start it again, but you, you made it just in time before I ended it. Okay, cool. Sorry. I'm trying to answer you and figure out what's happening with my phone as well. No, no, it's not a problem. We're happy that you okay. were able to join us. Okay. What are the questions? What do you have for me? What's um, going 
<laughs> um, okay, Miss Emma had dropped a question. She said, um, please ask TK about the day he went on a rampage and beat Zimbabwe all by himself. What got, what got over him? It remains a very proud South African moment for us. Oh, uh, thanks. Oh, interesting questions. I actually see my sister, my younger sister, just logged in as well. So uh, much love. Tough so game. Much love. Yeah, tough game. We, she was actually there. So we, we were locked in with the game. I think we were down several points and yeah. trying everything, looking for each other. And then my sister, I always know my family is in the stadium. So my sister walked out of VIP and then went to go sit with all the guys for well, my childhood team, Rockville Epony. And as she was walking across, I was standing on the sideline and she looked at me and she said, let's go, come on, let's go, Kobe, Kobe time. Right? Yeah. I always watched it, I, we always growing up, we used to watch the games together. She's like, yo, come, Kobe time, let's go, like right now. And I looked at her and she just gave me a look and I was like, shit, if it's ever going to be a moment, it's right now. Kept to the moment. And then I just, I guess, just locked in. You know, so that's, that's part of the reason where I was just like, you know what? The ball does run through me. I'm trying to run the plays. Hey, why not be the play? So I just kind of just locked in and zoned out. And you just win. My my, one yeah. of my Mamba mentality moments, yeah. That was one of your Mamba mentality moments. Great. And as Coach, as Coach Craig uh, would say when he was our teammate, it's like it's a big nuts moment. I can use that word, right? And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, come on, man. Big nuts moments. Big moments need big nuts. So I was yeah. like, you know what? So I just went for it. <laughs> and another question from Moody Moody 14 says, um, what's your favorite national team memory? Favorite national team memory is actually always against Angola because I, I always measure myself up as to how we play against Angola because they've been the best on the continent. So yeah. my first time... Uh, I think it was in Egypt when we played against Angola and I, I did my then signature move, just drive two dribbles to the right, pulled up and I made the first, scored the first basket. Coach, Coach Scholl said, you know, you need to step up. And then I realized, oh shit, you need to play the whole rest of the game. It doesn't matter if you score one point. And you could just see Angola change their different levels as each quarter went in. Yeah. And when I say different levels, like they executed, they, the execution became more precise as the game went on. They were more deliberate as to what they were doing. And I was like, this is what it means to be against the big, the kings of Africa at the moment, like the big dogs. This is, this is how they play. So that's one of my, my favorite eye-opening moments is saying, listen, man, it's not one play, it's the whole game. And you have to continually like up your game every play every position, whether it's on offense, whether it's on defense, because these guys were locked in on defense. We couldn't get what we wanted. But on offense, they were getting everything. So I was like, you know what? This is, this is where I need to take my, my game if I want to improve. And then fast forward about 10 years into it, I think it was in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're playing against Angola, and I, I had a similar game. So I've, I've had similar games that I, I, I did against uh, Zimbabwe here at home. Right, but it's been outside the country, and people like our our, our local talent or our fellow South Africans weren't there to, to, to see it, you know. And there's there's many players who've had similar games. Quinton has had them. Lesekho Malabata has had them. Joseph Mazibuko has had games like that. You know, guys have had big games outside the the borders of our country. But this particular one in in Zimbabwe, in Bulawayo, after we shook hands after the game a couple of the, the Angolan guys came up to me and shook my hand. You know, they were like, yo, where are you playing? How are you hooping? What's up? And I was like, wow, this is actually one of the biggest shout outs that you can get yeah, on the field. And I was like, happy. one of the biggest. Yeah, I was like, and it's happening to me right now. And I was like, wow, I just got validated by, by some of the best players on the continent, you know, for, for, for yeah. being tough to guard, tough to handle. And I was like, wow, that just put me in the in the category, so for me, that is my one of my biggest moments against the, the top elite players of our on the continent. And we're here talking about um, the national te- the national games that you've played or international games that you've played. But when did your first encounter with basketball start? First encounter with basketball 
Yo, how old was I? I think I was like 11, 12. I was watching mm. KTV. Bochaya, just sitting, you know, and then uh, the then coach, Jackie Masenia, walked into my mom's house in Soweto and wanted to use the hall to, to, for a meeting of some sort. And I was like, hey, man, take this kid out. He's watching TV. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a clinic that day, and I never turned back. So literally, the, from my mother's house, the court is not even more than 200 meters away. So from then, I could hear when someone was at the court shooting or a ball dribbling. So mm-hmm. I would always wake up or clean the house, do my chores, and then go out and play. And this was in Soweto? This is in Soweto, yes. My mom's house was in Soweto, yeah. So how was, how was the um, basketball culture back then, the basketball lifestyle? What was it like? Oh, it was big, man. You had, you had players already then getting scholarships to Rao University, which is now University of, of Johannesburg. Uh, we had Tebe. Uh, you have Tabi. So some of the guys who was like, listen, you can, like me looking at them, I was like, actually, I can get big. You don't have to stay small. You don't have to be lean. You don't have to look like a soccer player. You know, you don't have to wear skinny yeah. jeans. You can actually work out and, and be big, be formidable, be, 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 be strong, like get stronger. So I was like, and I saw that from them when they came back from, from Tabi. So came back from the U.S. Tebe went from Rao University. And all the guys that I played with, go Eponi basketball clubs who were ahead of me, they were always talented. So I was like always playing against better talent than myself. You know? And there's a question here that says, there's a basketball um, team in my hood. My worry is the hood is not really supportive talent-wise. Any advice you'd like to give to the youth to keep up the moment. The which, moment. Which hood? Which hood? That's very broad. Uh, Kimang. Uh, hey, Docs. He's. I think he's from Rustenburg, or he lives in Pretoria somewhere. Yeah, Docs is all. You need to be more specific, man. I mean, log on to the pages. Uh, let's talk basketball. There's everywhere. There's like reach out. You also need to be active on your side. You know, we we, we can't. I mean, we're living in a time where there's no excuse for you finding a court and, and somewhere to compete. People say, I, I, yo. no, I'm going to save charity as I mean, that's what I used to do. Save up my money for captain and then go play with guys in, in Johannesburg, you know, and then come back later more. Uh, so I always used to seek out competition. So, and then you've got YouTube, you've got all these clips, like work on your game. You know, that's what the one thing guys don't do. Like, guys don't get better. They don't work on the game. They think because they can bounce and shoot, they think they can play. Ah, uh-uh. They can't shoot. They can't dribble. They can't bounce. So it's, it's easy, it's easy to, to still be relevant. I mean, that's why you've got players like myself, Neo Motiba, uh, Cyril, like guys born in the 80s, like still being relevant. Mm-hmm. I know, because guys don't work on their game. Yeah. And then Quinton, still playing when he's not talking on the mic. Absolutely. And then um, just going back to when you still played for the senior national basketball team, you created a few good memories and some bad um, looking at the politics behind basketball back then. Could you like just yep. paint a picture for us of what happened, you know, from the fallout between the players and the management, the disbanding and the replacement of players, all of that? <laughs> on which tour it's happened so many times you have to be specific I you know, think the like one it... that, 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 that caused a lot of commotion was the one um, during the Four Nations tournament I think oh okay the build up for the Four Nations I think we just come back from from Zimbabwe and we were playing well nice tight knit team so it's, actually that's that's one of the times where I, I realized the power of social media and I think that's when uh, themselves, uh, the people in charge of the federation, realized that hey, you need to get a, a, a nip, and under, not a nip, but an, a full understanding of how social media works. And and now they, I think they've got, they figured out how it works and how to kind of control and manipulate it as well. But what what happened then is it was just I don't want to say misunderstanding. It was it was them trying to. And I say them, I say the federation at the time, the people in charge, trying to impose themselves on us. And I was like, they forget. We've been, myself, I've been on the national team since I was 17 years old. You know, I'm almost 30, I'm, I'm 36, 30, 37. So that's a, a period of, of, what, 20 years? So 
yes, there's some, some tournaments I haven't been to, but we've got the experience. We know the history of how they deal with us. So we were like indemnity forms. We we're like, no, listen, we'd like our medical forms. We want to be covered. Because then the the the, the BNL was playing, guys were playing the BNL. You you report into your clubs. You've got your medical medical aid, so you want to know that you're covered, and you want to know that there's pay, right? Because they're yeah. the one who brought up. So if there's going to be pay, put the number on the paper. Let's sign. Let's let it be an agreement. Mm. So none of that was honored. And then what they normally do is that they always just report to their up, uh, higher ups and say, "No, man, these kids." And they forget we're now young men with families. These kids, Baba Tateka and Arabajuri to know they didn't tell us some of the contracts, even today, these the that the contracts these kids buy, they don't have an amount on them. They don't disclose anything. So when we were trying to hold them accountable, they were like, No, they they did everything wrong. And then they realized that we we actually had a, a small media plan, we put our minds together, went on Twitter, went on Facebook, and when we caught them reacting is when they slipped up. But then we, we actually got to go to court, not to court. Uh, we got lawyers involved. Uh, thankfully, the, the owner of the, the then team, Doozy Royals, you know, helped us out. It was myself, Linda, and uh, Nell, who, who said, listen, we'll, we'll risk our careers. We'll risk the national team. That's how much love we have for the green and gold. We need to set a standard, and we need mm -hmm. to know how this operates, you know, that when you yeah. take it this far. So your responsibility is to always push the bar a little further for the next generation and allow them to understand a little bit more. So we went to court, and then what we discovered is that, listen, we are subcontracted for the national team. We're not employees of the national team. So this is information that players need to know. When it, uh, not, not, not actually just players, but everyone. When you go into a contract, know what it is, know what amount you're signing for, and know what you're accountable for and what the other party is accountable for. So we, I, I was happy we actually went there. Uh, we lost. Or definitely, yeah, I think we lost. Uh, but what I know now is that the next generation, should they want to fight, they know how to do it instead of not knowing where to start. You know, so we took that for 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 the guys. It wasn't about winning or losing; it was about gaining experience. But do you think that those um, off-court politics may have had an impact on the performance of the team at any time? Absolutely, man. Politics and sports should never mix, you know? Absolutely and, 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 and then people always like to say, no, between the lines, no, shut up. You know, don't, don't get sentimental. Don't be a leader. Shut up. Politics and politicians and sports should never mix. It's, it's that plain and simple. They should just mix when you say, listen, this is the money that we have for you guys. Is there a plan for the Federation? Pump it in, and that's where it should stop. But now you've got uh, ex-politicians, uh, ex-cadres, just, you know, just ruining the sport. And because all they need to do is give a report up to higher ups, which is their friends, their buddies, and, and no one really cares. And not just in basketball, in every non-successful sporting code in the country. The longer you are in this game, the more you hear from people who are higher up, like this is what's actually happening. And you can't really talk about it because you don't have the evidence. But when you listen to them, you realize, oh, my God, that is what's happening. There's not going to be any growth in this game, you know? Yeah. Because you can't report a bad police officer to another bad police officer. Who's going to file that report and see that through? And there was you know? also an altercation, yeah. There was an altercation, um, I think, during the pre-training tournament where you and two other of your teammates, you weren't allowed to attend the camp. Um, you were sent back. Um, you weren't allowed to attend the camp. And then, um, I think then... The other players, when your teammates found out about the camp, they also kind of um, weren't happy about the news. Mm -hmm. I think it's still, it's not the Four Nations. It's, it's yeah, probably around them. Because what they, what they normally do is that they, then they call the guys individually on their side. They'll threaten their jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if you work for a particular broadcasting company, they will, or a sibling of yours, they will then say, we'll get that sibling fired. You yeah. know, they'll, they'll flip you guys' livelihoods. If you attend a, a particular educational institution, uh, they will then say, we will then revoke your scholarship. You know, so they, they threaten the guys' livelihood or education, you know, mm. stuff like that. And then 
guys will, will crumble, which you, you understand. It's, it's, it's how they're planning on their livelihood and their future. But we're like, listen, if they can't affect me or influence anything I'm doing, then stand up. Show these guys that you, at some point you have to stand up and, and fight because at the end of the day, you are representing your country, not as a basketball mm-hmm. player, but as a man or a woman who, who wears the green and gold. It comes with a certain amount of pride. So stand, represent, and, and fight for what you believe is right as a South African because I am representing, what, the, the 50, plus peop- 50 million plus people in this country. So I'm, I'm going to fight in my own way, in my own circle. You know? I'm going to influence change in my, the best way I can. It was really good to see you guys standing up um, in such situations. It's something that not a lot would have the courage to do. It shows no, how much don't. pride you had representing the country. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because you look at the, the Angelo Quinn situation, right? In, in the, the particular league he was playing in. How he stood up and then how he was shunned, then how he was blackballed, and then how his own teammates uh, didn't even stand up or they'll, everyone will, will say they'll stand up in their own way, which doesn't really affect change. Angelo risked it all for what he loved and he lost, you know? He was shunned, he's blackballed. And then you have some of some guys in, in a particular province, they all wear t-shirts in, in supporting what, what, what is wrong. And you're like, hey man, you wore a t-shirt, then what? Then you're going to complain that most of the action happens in, in, in Joburg. And you guys are counted out. How about you put that T-shirt on and, and see how much change that does, you know? People are scared to take action, you know? Yeah. You can't win if you don't do anything. And that's what all of these guys have done. And it's not like I want to fight the powers that be in this league. No, I just want progress to happen, you know? Progress, that's all. Progress, and not the progress you see, the progress that reflects on the game growing uh, like having structures, like official structures where kids can be funneled through. I mean, similar to rugby, similar to soccer, similar to netball, yeah. you know? Like, let there be a viable future. Let the kids be able... It's the biggest growing sports on the planet. How are we still stuck in the problems? How are we still stuck in the problems and the, the non-resolutions of the 1990s? Yeah. You know? Yeah, or like a decade ago. Last century, actually. Let's say last century. Because the problems that last century are affecting our game now. There has to be progress. There has to be progress, you know? And looking at the fact that you were amongst uh, many talented South African athletes who got the opportunity to study abroad, I see there's a question here by Kimati23. What did you miss the most when you were in the U.S.? What do I... What did I miss the most about being in the U.S.? Yeah. About home. My family, that's it. Family and friends. I mean, that was a time, it was just Hotmail that I used. It was Hotmail and Yahoo accounts to communicate. Photocom for me, .co.za is how I used to communicate with my mother. But that's it. But I understood why I was there. I understood what I had to do. You know, it was to do well in school, firstly, NCAA. No, NC, that was in high school. Do well in school, get your grades, play hard, and then hopefully get a, a compete for a scholarship and, you know, and, and survive out there. And can you tell us about your experience of playing? Did I answer um, the question? You... Sorry? Hello? I can hear you. Did we lose Bagani? You still were there. You still have you. I think there's a network problem. Back. Hi, Takani. Yes, I think so. Hey, sorry. I think I disappeared for a second there. Yes. Um, I think we got you back. Yeah. We're all good. I think we have you back. Can you hear me? We got you back. Hello? Sakani? Mm, Let's try and get him back. Hi, Sakani, do we have you back? 
Uh, I think so. Yep. Okay, that's good. I'm typing, that we have you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Is everything good okay, on your sorry. end? Sorry. Yeah, I'm still trying to mess with the brightness of my camera. I don't know uh, what I, what I did or when I dropped it or what's happening. No, it's not a problem. As long as we have you back, then everything is good. Um, Emma Ledwaba. Uh, what is happening with my network? Mm, we still got you. We're still here. Oh, okay, cool. Yes, I was saying a question from Emma Ledwaba. She says, "I feel like, oh, I feel there's an opportunity for new blood to take over the administration of the game in South Africa." Where's your headspace around that? Would you be keen to take up an administrative role um, in basketball? No, definitely. I just, I mean, I, I tried. I think it was about four or five years ago. And then things always start and fizzle out. And I realized, actually, uh, you just need to be consistent and, temp and, and figure out the landscape as to what's happening. So Emma knows. I'll reach out to her and we will we'll get involved because, I mean, like as other African countries, the successful ones, the basketball players are the ones running the program. So we need to stop talking about it and be about it. And Emma, yeah, you can hold me accountable to that. I'll, I'll let, I'm, speak, I'm speaking out to Emma. Emma, you can hold me accountable to that one. I'll definitely step in. To provide the change that we um, so exactly. desperately need in the basketball community. We'd appreciate exactly. that a lot. Exactly. Another so I, I question. Can't, I can't just... Go on. You may um, go continue. It's fine. Hi. Because well, yeah, you... we can't just keep talking about it. So I need to just actually be one of the guys and just kind of, you know, be the the effect. So put put your money where your mouth is. So yeah. Looking forward to seeing that. And Tapa says, "How is the standard of basketball in USA compared to home?" Uh, we can't even compare. Uh, and and that's for saying we we've got the talent, we've got the guys. It's it's a system over there, a functioning system. You know, uh, there's you know what the the eight year olds are doing. You know what the the five year olds are doing. They're already playing some sort of games. No one cares about winning. So there's a there's a structure for everybody, and it's similar to what NBA junior NBA is doing. You know, trying to trying to get kids playing, trying to get them competitive, uh, teaching them fundamentals and, and going forward. So if you look at it, we'll say there is a high school league, right, which is the kids will then play in season. Then they've got the, the club teams that they play outside of season, which will then, then they'll have a, a competition like the junior NBA. Then on weekends, there's tournaments like all over the country, right? And that's just in high school. And then the college guys, they are always training for their season because that's that's what they're there for, right? <laughs> I can be I can be what do you call it? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, NCAA. So the kids, the kids, the student athletes, I can be contradictory. That's what I'll say. Uh, so the kids are oh, you always working out, playing school, job on campus, and then you've got the professional league. So it's it's a whole functional system where Coaching is not a part-time passion thing. It's a job, yeah. you know. Coaches are talking to scouts, you know. Uh, kids are getting better. Like, you can see a, kid's, a difference in the kid's talent uh, from month to month, you know. He's got a new skill. He's more confident. He's doing something different if he has a good coach. And then, yeah, you can actually see, okay, he is not being coached. I mean, the first year, BNL, there's a, I won't mention his name. There was a kid... We're doing a drill. Talented kid. Dunk. He can put up numbers. You know, nice kid to watch. But then he couldn't do a three-man drill. Three-man weave. You know? And you're like, uh-uh. And then, you know, so it's one of those things where you say, okay, he's a raw talent. So you kind of have to ease mm -hmm. into him, you know, not be hard on him, lower your expectations to him when it comes to X's and O's, see how you can help him out on the court, which then you're like, oh, I'm now that older guy teaching you know, then you're like, I'm not just playing. And then people wonder why. Oh, why can't you turn it off? You're like, turn it, uh, why aren't you performing? You're like, I'm actually nursing guys on the court right now. You know? So yeah. when, when that is off, you can then actually play and have fun. You know? And that was my last, my last role on the national team. 
uh, coach was like, I just need you to, to run the system consistently so the guys can be comfortable in the system. I don't need you to, to be putting up numbers or, you know, being effective. Just get us into a structure, you know, like a, a point forward, like a leadership role. So I was like, okay, cool, I'll do that. And can you, can you take us through a, um, a few of your favorite experiences of playing um, in America, maybe at, and uh, Hamilton College, just what you were able to experience from that whole journey? My, some of my favorite memories. Okay, let me start at high school. We was playing for an end one team. We went to Las Vegas. It was called the best of the summer, right? Where all the talent was in Adidas camp, Adidas tournament. So we were there. We were lucky as end one, which was like, we were happy because we were all wearing end one. But it was one of the worst things to do because we went to an Adidas sponsored uh, tournament. There was no way they were going to let you win or get out your pool because it's all the Adidas, uh, what do you call it, talent that Adidas has now brought from all across the U.S. to come play in this final tournament for the scouts to come watch. And I think that, that's when I also realized, hey, I need to work a lot because I think it was Rudy Gay. I was playing against Rudy Gay. He plays for the San Antonio Spurs now. And all my coach said to me was like, TK, you are trying. You are trying. That is what an elite uh, D1 starting impact uh, player does. Uh, he's elite. And it was like, then he continued to yell at the rest of the team. He was like, there's nothing else you can do. He's just that refined. And that was Rudy Gay in, in high school. He was just a, a phenomenal player. You know, so that's one of my favorite moments. The second one, playing for Hamilton, uh, is when we were, I forgot which team we were playing, and we were in overtime, and the game was about to start, and the floor that we were actually standing on was shaking because both crowds, uh, the opposition and uh, our, our, our home crowd, were yelling that the arena was so loud that the floor was actually shaking that we were playing on, and I was like, this is surreal. And then you look around, it's just people, some people yelling motivation, some people not yeah. yelling so much motivation at you. So it was, uh, it was nice. It was nice, nice feeling to have, you know? Yeah. And there's another question here by, I think it's Yeli Jr. He says, please ask TK to tell the story of the fourth quarter in game one between South Africa and Zimbabwe at Wembley. So many questions, actually. Yeah. Junior, you missed it, buddy. I started off with that one. But just a, a, brief, a brief recap for you, if I may, Dinawa. Uh, it, was, it was one of my, my Mamba moments. You know, and I think the, the guys I traveled to Zimbabwe with, uh, the last time we played Zimbabwe there, realized that I, was, I, was, I actually shot like that as well. Like Fumani was there, Silepo was there, uh, Chief was there a couple of other guys who can attest to it. So I was having a very good shooting one. But this particular one, I was like, listen, something needs to happen. Something needs to happen now. At that particular moment, when I'm having that thought, my younger sister is also just walking into the arena and is like, yo, let's go. It's Kobe time. Let's, let's, let's lock and load. You need to do something. And I was like, hey, man, since the play we were running at the time, I think was four, was running through the, the four guard. And that meant like I had first option whether to run the play or to take the shots and I was like hey listen I'm just going to let them fly and I just locked and loaded and the team the, the, the energy fed off because Selepe hit a three now hit a three so the team actually just galvanized around that momentum and we just went we just went at it you know we were like we're not going to lose at home and have yeah. our our fellow, our fellow African brothers come celebrate and have fun on yeah. our floor not a chance <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially when you find out that they had planned to to come host the uh, what do you call it the next tournament in South Africa on our ground, so we were going to be a, a plus one in our own country. <laughs> not a chance, not happening on our watch. So we locked in and and we did what we had to do, you know. And it was, it was great because all the guys just just fed off that momentum, and I can still remember Coach Clement. Just, just yelling at me and me nodding. I still don't know what he was saying. Um, another question here by Brendan Durant. He says, you taught me a lot too at the Wembley pickups. 
well, it's not a question, it's a comment rather. You've always taught us as young bloods in a way that honestly helps us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's the one way I can actually pass the torch. A lot of the, the gods, because everyone thinks I play four or five. I'm actually a god, you know, in the US. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a god, I'm a two, three. But then <laughs> I've got post moves, yeah. So I've got post moves, so then I, I just go down low because the guys don't work out, the guys are not strong, and it's just an easier game because no one actually puts in the work. So I'll, I'll actually, the guys that I'm beating up on, I'll actually give them tricks as how to stop me and how to move their body and how to see or give them self-position. And I was like, I'm not guarding you now because your teammates are not looking at you because you're not a threat. And a lot of guys will think I'm talking trash. And I was like, if you actually take your emotions out of it, you realize I'm giving you some solid advice. If you're a threat, your teammates would see you. But since you're not, why should I see you as well? So I'm like, go be a threat. If you are a threat, you have a presence, your teammates will see you, and then I then have to play defense. And as many of the, as many of, um, the fortunate athletes, sorry, as many of the fortunate athletes who got the opportunity to still stay in the game, you've gotten the opportunity to commentate for the BNL, and you've also played in the very same league so what is the experience of the two different sides, being a player, playing in the Basketball National League, and then being a commentator of the league? I'm just happy I played in it when it was competitive. Because right now, as Absolutely. a 36-year-old, as a 30, as a for me to even think and dare of, of, that I can go in and compete and actually be an all-star is an insult. You know, it just shows you that the guys don't, the guys there. There's, there's, there's the elite 12 players. But they're not on, they're not, they're on like the, the super teams. And we all know the four super teams. So the other teams, ah, I can easily get a couple of guys and go beat up on them. And I can say this comfortably. Just take my cell phone number. Guys, and I know this is, I'm calling guys who are, are not in shape or in somewhat shape. And guys who I know are still working on their bodies right now because they don't want to get old. And we can easily go beat up on, a, on one, of those, one of those teams. The, the top four teams, you know they'll give you a run for the money because it's, it's the guys that actually take uh, pride in their game and they want to compete a little bit and they, they, they're getting stronger. So that's it. And shout out to the, to the team that have won when the league was competitive and not when the teams that have won when the team league was destroyed and made weak just to have a, a nice, what do you call it, uh, press release. You know, yeah, and hashtag shots fired. <laughs> okay, we sense the shots, we sense the shots. Um, and this is like one of the many platforms where we get the opportunity to just get to hear that experience and the knowledge that you have to share. And it's really, really, really been um, great hearing all of that from you. Um, okay. It's these kind of experiences from all levels of basketball that's just going to make an impact to the people that are watching right now and the people that will get to watch this video once we have it up on YouTube. So it's been such a great pleasure getting to hear all of this from you. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you would want to say just to uh, encourage and to move. I just had a, a random thought, you know, for the, the guys playing in the, in the college leagues, I would really love if, if someone could just keep their stats, you know, because there's a lot of guys who put up numbers, but no one knows about them. I mean, like my, myself and Pumla are fortunate. Pumla Satula, she also went to Hamilton. Mm. We're fortunate enough to be in the thousand points club. You know, we spent yeah. four years there and we scored over a thousand points and there's certain guys who have accomplished similar things in, in, in our country and they need to be recognized. So if we could find all score sheets, you know, and we could just create a nice credible database for, for guys to know guys who have played in the past and, and they can also be remembered. That would be awesome. You know, so let's start keeping stats. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think through the help of varsity basketball, that might be yeah. a bit easier um, mm -hmm. to do. I think that's actually something that's in one of the right direction in, t in terms of the growth of basketball in the country right exactly. now. Exactly. So, so we're like, we're, when that starts again, like, so we, we want to know how many points Evaristo has been scoring the whole season coming into that, that varsity cup. We know he's been averaging X amount. Angelo's averaging X amount. Musubiri's yeah. averaging X amount. 
You know, the guys in Cape Town are averaging X amount. So we've got everyone's stats. So we know what to expect just looking at the numbers. Then we're like, oh, how is he averaging 20? But he can't even do a, a right-handed layup. Who is he playing against? You know, then we can, we can question and ask those questions. You know, we can verify. Yeah. Because you're, you're 20 in Cape Town. Yes, I, I love shouting the Gabriel brothers out. Your 20 points in Cape Town is four points in Joburg. Mm. It's, 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 it's different. Your, 20, your, your 12 points in Free State, yeah, is exactly that. 12 points in warm-up. Because, you, you know, you, you don't have that much uh, competition. Not that yeah. I'm shouting out provinces. I'm just making an example of those provinces. Because the guys who come to Joburg, I believe, steal, shop, and steal. And mm -hmm. if you're not steal, you're a piece of wood. We're just using you to get hot. And I think we can take one last question just before we let you go. Tapo says, with your wealth of knowledge, I'm also including all the, le all the legends. Um, what will it take to create a unified effort to help restructure basketball in South Africa from grassroots to national level? Uh, I think we need to get uh, uh, players and people who have been on the court uh, involved, get... Yeah. Everyone we know who's got basketball uh, IQ, knowledge, uh, involved, and just scrap that whole BSA people who are involved. They literally have got no vision. They're taking vision from other countries, other people. And if you're stealing someone else's vision, you don't know how to implement it, you know? And keep the politics out of it, guys. Let's play the game. If it's not about getting more, more kids on the court, more players on the court, you are not doing the right thing. It should just be that simple. You are failing at your job. That's it. You are failing. You should be fired. They all have my numbers should they want to call me, the people in BSA. Um, hopefully, if they are tuned in, they, they will call you and take They're you out. They're not tuned in. They are not tuned in. Don't worry. They will hear about this, and then they will talk amongst themselves. No one will call me. It's fine. All right, so Kenny, thank you so much once again for giving us this opportunity to just um, um, learn about your experiences and to pick your brain a bit. I really like the fact that people have been co posting relevant questions. Thank you to everyone that's been posting and the comments as well. Um, so once again, yeah. thank you, Takanim. And cool. let's hope that everything we've been talking about is going to fall on the correct ears and there will be progression within the basketball, the South African basketball community. Cool. Thank you for the platform, Dinao, and everyone who tuned in. If you have uh, any basketball-related questions, uh, don't be scared to jump into the DM. Uh, good to go. I don't mind answering those. And, yeah, we could take it from there. All right, man. Thanks, Tep Thanks, Tagani. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Tagani. Thanks, Teppo and Dinao. Shout out to Teppo for making this happen as well. <laughs> Bye. Bye.